I'm Bill Ray of Willits. I've lived here 50 years and more. W.J. Ray is my poetry handle. Um, the poem I, I'm going to read, The Willits Farewell, originally was delivered in a program of, uh, about Willits. Uh, and uh, I thought, since it stands alone as a poem, that we would record it uh, separately. Uh, and we're in the uh, Carnegie Library, the Willits uh, TV studio, doing that today. Um, maybe uh, a word of introduction about my background might be helpful for people who see the video and haven't known me for some of those 50 years. Um, as a child, I was a singer. I enjoyed singing uh, the rhythm, the melody, uh, the meaning of the words. It was an expressive impulse that eventually turned to paper uh, in the form of diaries and letters. I found that since I worked from the age of 15, I didn't have a whole lot of time for my uh, literary interest. And uh, poetry was a brief, natural outlet for the anguish and joy that I felt in the, in the course of living. This uh, self-expression is reflected in my website, wjray.net. Since 1985, wanting to share poetry's special kind of beauty, I began to produce and read at poetry readings in Willits before small town gatherings. These programs included Miriam Patchen, wife of the great Kenneth Patchen, Gary Snyder, Jack Hirschman, Joanne Kiger, Linda Knoll, Mary Norbert Corte, Sharon Dubiago, Daniel Marlin, and others. My work has appeared in radio on KZYX, on uh, TV, uh, videos, that is DVDs, as well as in written forms. Uh, they call me a poet's poet, perhaps owing to my sense that the fundamental character of poetry lies in the breath and the heartbeat, and so becomes the soul's song particular to every poet. Rhythm and music emanating from within, uh, in fact, have affected chronicles, bards, and balladeers through the ages, so this is a long tradition. There's nothing unique about it. Now, regarding their will, it's farewell. This poem began when I woke at midnight once, thinking about the more than 50 years I have resided and labored in the Willits Valley. To this place and these people, I owe everything. I traveled here as a young man and will speak to you as an old man. Here my wife of 55 years lies buried. Many souls have passed on before us whom I intend to honor and remember. Their humble commitment to the simple laws of survival and the eternal beauty inherent to these mountains and rivers. Never had they thought to be memorialized, but poetry aims for the overlooked truth. The Little Lake Valley has provided our countless generations, living and dead, a blessed source of peace and stability, which no calendar can comprehend. Now, um, I'd like to make a personal statement. I owe a debt of love to the memory of Judith Ann Hegler Ray and also to the presence of Nancy Ann Trickler, a debt of love that I want to honor 
with my poetry. It's a debt that cannot be paid, but only recognized and honored. Now to the poem. Uh, it's a longish poem. Um, it has an epigraph at the beginning by A. E. Hausman, whose style you would recognize as different from mine, and also a stanza of my poetry from 1996 that I thought was appropriate as a uh, postscript to the text of the poem. And we begin. Into my heart an air that kills from yon far country blows. What are those blue remembered hills? What spires, what farms are those? That is the land of lost content. I see it shining plain, the happy highways where I went and cannot come again. My wake up ad hoc midnight threnody must serve as a collective farewell to Mark and Ina Walker and her sister Mabel Black. He told me how to grease a wagon wheel and sharpen a scythe, and he gave me his first wife's Edith's carved missionary chest from Siam as his sign of regard. To Ed and Mary Hayes and their daughters living and dead, Ed sold me three-foot virgin redwood shakes that covered the front of the house. Bertha Cook and her daughter Viva Pearson, who predicted, rightly, she would die before her century-old mother after leaving their land once a nursery below Hilltop. And gentle Mary Pearson giving us leftover pizzas at Al's Redwood Room. Cliff Miller, his Main Street barber shop, his wife Thomasina, and the profusion of flower beds behind the house. Pretty little bastards, ain't they, he said. Master mechanic Carl Carlson and his wife Winnie, a far-off legate and their son Carl, maintaining a mountain colony's junks and dying too soon. Janice and Frank Rust, the millionaire DuPonts, he said that life makes so much more sense the second or third time around. And later it was Frank and Sylvia who moved on to Hawaii and she died there, but left me a restored memory, the old Chesapeake Bay Amusement Park Len Echo and its huge mechanical laughing lady saying, ha, 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 forever. And Ellen Wormuth, the dream she told of reaching Rome just before her death, told me by her caretaker, the singer, the subtle poetess, Bonnie Coates Blackwell, who herself has pre preceded us in departure. And it was her blonde cousin, Faith, who had been my first love in Washington, D.C., 1954. And dear Ruby and Earl Snook, so generous and mild on East Hill Road, she signaling me yet with the yellow tanager on the telephone wire every springtime. The old world Italian Deggies and Barry Patch and Anna Collins on State Street. Now Sue Hathaway on the porch there, her memory faded. Mills and Suzanne Matheson along with Frank Rust saving the valley from the biomass cancer disaster. Without fanfare, $5,000 each for a fight back EIR consultant. Elsie Allen, the legendary Pomo basket maker who approved Judith's beginning turn of the reed. Self-reliant Mr. Winthrop Owen and his World War I wooden camp box set out for sale at a swap meet. Kathy Neff of high religious devotion 
keeping our daily bread going for years. Doc Watson, his wife cutting irises every April, and his overloud greeting, hoy hoy, an idiosyncratic coin of human discourse. Skill to Dale Justice inevitably, victim to Agent Orange, and not one word of bitterness. Zephyr Wagonette, the sad child who haunts me still from those years. Walter Camp, who scoffed at all authorities, from the Bureau of Land Management to Sears and Roebuck, and died courageously, a brave soldier at home. Gerald and Miriam Ganley, their ridge wheel subdivision cabin in sight of the sea. Dale and Lorraine Cave, he who survived World War II and Korea, and she who took University of Portland chemistry classes from Linus Pauling in the 20s, attending with his future wife, to whom he would not give an A if in so doing it risked his reputation. Jeanette Foy and all the proto-Indian Roys under their diminutive matriarch Mishtu. Jane Hera, the unassuming Pisces rancher and twin engine pilot who with her daughter Margie had assembled and cataloged a world-class seashell collection. The skilled pioneers, Doug Surin, Ross Wilson, the Gathers, Crow and Elena, Barry, staying over in the hollow beyond the Little Lake Cemetery where Judith's remains are buried. And Ralph Bostrom living into his 90s at Northbrook Manor, who recalled his mother and aunt admonishing him when a child. Ralphie, always remember that old man over there because he saw Abraham Lincoln. The German-born Burkharts of Shake City and their matriarch, Hannah, who did not back down when a mountain lion trespassed her clearing's lawn, saying to it, you're a beautiful animal, but you're not wanted here. And it preened and walked away. Mrs. Sly, when I said I was a Jew, not a Christian, she replied, well, you're a good un. Steve Kaler and Kenny, who helped with the house, then migrated like Randy Abbott, the Flipperts and the Jim Gibbonses to Hawaii for good. Brian Ardner hoarsely calling on the phone as he approached the exit and bequeathed us his car. Devoted Frank and Cleva Centel, his forebears, ancient Redwood Sawyers, whose family gave me their riven Sherwood fire bell. Helen Moore Bartow, who took her horse to school in Willits before motor busing had begun. Bill and Marion Crispin, she newly married, had given the then child Judith fresh cookies in 1950s Boonville. She crashed and died driving home from Boonville on the way back to Willits. The Crows and the Wagners, their uncanny tracking eyes and rifle range on Canyon Road and Pine Mountain, from Covalo to Cloverdale, known as the best hunters and fishermen in their time. Weta Matthews, her rings and earrings, silver threads and golden needles. Mimi Shiner, making a cloisonne talisman for Avra. Katie Selliver's straw packed tomato vines, and her Lauren Bacall voice. Gordon Wagonette, who watched the Empire State Building go up a floor every day, and when he attended Oberlin, the later world-famous political theorist Sheldon Wolin called him Tex. Mr. Way at 1650 East Hill Road, offering his garage full of windows and doors, saying his bossy new wife still thought she was a bride. And John Phillips, 
giving me his son Blanche to our all-heart redwood carriage house doors for our Japanese gate before he shot himself, shamed by an insurance fraud. Bob Brown, witching our land to discover endless water throughout, then adamantly refusing the $50 fee. Roy and Lorraine Sullivan, with their olives, her poetry, their children, tragedies, and love. The Montana next boxer and hunting guide, Harold Baldy Connerly, at Ridgewood Ranch. I asked him if he was there at Shelby, Montana in 1923 when Dempsey bested Tommy Gibbons. He came back with, was I there? I was the undercard. Baldy, born on my mother's birthday and dying on mine. Frank Freitag, another elder, the Noyo theater projectionist, who also died on my birthday, his wife following, three days later. The old man at the Sea Biscuit Ranch who told me in Arizona as a child in 1910, his parents woke him to view Haley's Comet transiting the entire sky. The Collies, all four, Phil, Lena, Alita, Anita, caring to the end for the priest at St. Anthony's. Alita advising me once, we have to protect our lovely little valley. Herb Pruitt, who had wired the nose cone of the Explorer One rocket and created the Exploratorium with Frank Oppenheimer, Worked all night before the Mendocino County Museum's grand opening in 1972 and went to sleep on the grass across the street while the throng celebrated their triumph. Gil Holmes, the AAA tow truck driver who, as a youth back in Clayton, New Mexico, captured a rustler on their land and at gunpoint made him take off his boots and walked the desert range back to town. Jerry Caldwell, an inveterate political enemy who became a friend, clearing our karma in time before he fell asleep on Highway 101 and drifted off the road to his death. Mary V.O. Davis and Beth Rockefeller, educators like archetypal aunts, dying obscure, abandoned, and forgotten. Mary Frenzel, saving Avra's high school career before uncomplaining, she passed on. Steve Galecko with his violin lessons for Hannah and his gift of an old iron porch swing for me. Einar Erickson, who was born in the Redwoods near Albion and gave me my first Willits choker setter job out on Sherwood. Annetta Corey Colon and her treasured pig Priscilla. Bert Kroll, born 1903, his Santa Claus like florid countenance and unflagging cheer. Scotty McBee, who gave me her green enameled milkshaker, hinting only of her past as a show dancer and perhaps more. The Urbanites, Lynn and Beth Early making a Willits living with their cameras and pens. The Ridgewood restaurant waitresses, Mary Evans and Joe Plumley, embracing me the last day I drove the South 101 rural route. George Davis, the far-sighted football wrestling coach and English teacher, including in Propedeutica, his educational manual, a fictional protagonist based on our eldest daughter, Lara, and who ran across the Safeway parking lot to tell me what a great kid Ken was. Edith Page, playing the piano at the Grange meetings, and her husband, Wilson, running the dump up on Canyon, complete with scavenging bears. Jack Frost, last of the Willits gunfight lineage. Olaf Simonson taking on drifters in Kovalo during the Depression so everyone would survive, and he lived to be over a hundred with 200,000 in the bank. 
Charlie Marshall, who in 1935 built what became our house using boards from a down-the-hill aging barn, and who asked me for a bag of soft cobbed corn because his teeth were gone. Mavis Bromagen, leading the Cape Mendocino Wheeler pioneers who logged the coastal hills to ship home timber by boat. Luther Sureborn, posthumously providing for Ewart Ems, his old Canadian fox tanner friend. Dolly Tyler's childish voice and joy opening her door at 175 Humboldt Street. The veteran Earl Spence and his constant companion, a silent little dog. Al Greenberg's liquors run by Eddie and Elvis Mills, she living on for decades to die in a Ukiah rest home. The Whiteds, the Cases, the Huffmans, the Sawyers up Sawyers Lane. Del Weston selling his garden bounty by the road every year and his widow, Jerry, mowing the f following grass close to the earth. Ancient piano player B. Barnwell, small and still spry even as the fire went down. Witness to William Jennings Bryan's 1920 oration at the theater in Willits when Lilburn Gibson arranged the stop. Willits pioneer Sion Fred Van Beber, living to the last on California Street. The opera teacher Nadine and husband Bud Patton out Rock Tree Valley. Fred Finke Jr., the piano tuner, who played Litz's concert number no. two to warm up for his Rotary Club accompaniments who was the one piano tuner Rachmaninoff demanded when he performed in 1930 San Francisco, who became a hero in that city when witnessing a bank robbery, he foiled the villain by opening his tool bag and throwing tuning tools at him, who then panicked and ran out without the cash. Fred said that he couldn't buy a meal in San Francisco after that, because someone would insist on paying his bill. Mike Compton, schooled in Rock Tree Valley and the teens who lost two fingers at the mill the night he skipped the Grange meeting at the farm center, which still stands as a church, and who made sure we got the East Side Road house and property after I stopped to talk on a rainy day, driving back to Berkeley. Blind Shelton's shut off upstairs, wildly inhabited with bats, and her nephew, Neil Saunders, who guarded his land like a backwoodsman of the 19th century. The Diamond Dip Grange suppers picked and cooked by valley farmers until they got too old. Les and Zula Devine, he the war era, war era Oakland police chief, who refused Warren's decree to arrest all Japanese people. Old Joe Quadrio coming into the Happy Belly to buy pears, and his son Joe Jr. driving out with Hugh Hinchcliffe to check out our derelict electrical lines and exclaim, Hugh, hold my hand. Ellis and Ethel Rugg, 60 years after delivering mail in a Model T out to Hearst in World War I, she insisting the government provide it, he giving me his leather stamp pouch, now a century old. The Valonis, their perfectly ordered mill shack house and garden lined with broad abalone shells. Viva Erickson, Hattie London, Lily Hines, her lovely voice reciting the Grange initiations from memory. Frontier Days Grand Marshal Ethel Clady, who stopped her saddle horse in the middle of the July 4th parade one year to kiss me at the sidewalk in front of J.P.'s bar, and the drunks looked on grimly. Retired judge and Mrs. Ford smiles in humble dwelling near the Carnegie Library 
and Mrs. Babcock's lonely days with drink after her husband had died. Burtis and Minta, Martindale riding their ponies above Covelo all summer, and their daughter Opal living on to past 90. Mrs. Cantrell, so warm and observing from her doorway with its authentic Bernard Maybeck's light box. The exemplary school, school teacher, Thelma Sawyers, and Mr. Herman Bonn, a distant relative, cared for according to their country code of honor, her agreeing she liked her irises better than most people. Dink Persico, who advised me to spur a bronc only when he was off the ground, and Florence, who outlived every friend she had back in Salinas, dying at 99, and their sons Chuck and Lee, who told a good story. The Hinch Cliffs just back from Nepal, starting the Symbols bookstore at the old soda works on San Francisco Street, only to quit it when a nightlife pickup plowed the building off its piers. Albert Hux selling me can't bust him jeans, which recalled the tale of his youthful cattle rustling in Laytonville in the 20s when he took home a load of buckshot in his butt. The childless John and Anita Manganos, their immigrant Italian Catholic goodness, first to last. Her siblings, George, Virginia, Annette, and Edith Ricagno, Edie destined for world acclaim. Ray Burris and Ruth, tending their foals and yearlings every spring that trotted shoulder to shoulder in delight. Stella James, the lady sharpshooter and horse wrangler who hunted these ridges and lands. The way out on Hearst Road Ramsings, Frances coming north summer since her early childhood. Clive and Jesse Adams at Emmendahl, and Clive Jr., the joyous and imperturbable, and Tamara, like newly baked bread, a soul for the future age. Delman and Donna Ford, the McKinleys, the Munsons, John and Jerry, dry farming, and Harold Ford mowing spring and fall. Lowell Alpers, United Airlines pilot and navigator, chief petty officer at 20 in World War II, who told me he was born on the plains but sought only one thing in life, the sea. He wrote his mother every week, and a week after flying home from her funeral, he died in his sleep. Pre-World War I rodeo champion Don Coleman and wife Petey, whose Minnesota uncle had cut Jesse James' saddle off his mount for a souvenir. And they detested their 20s silent film rivals, Rudolph Valentino and Pola Negri, Don telling me in contempt, if a man could be pretty, he was pretty. They hosted their Montana boyhood friend Gary Cooper during the hot 1930s Willett summers. Gary busting down the dusty Hearst Road in his Duesenberg. As Bing Crosby visited the Howards at the thousands of acres Ridgewood Ranch, enjoying uninhibited nature outdoors and in. The Requas, the Elder Pinches, the Snyders, Butins, and Cavanaugh's. Jesse Larson of the Shelton's. They lived way up String Creek for a hundred years where the income tax would never find them. She was tying her boots one morning when an old oak crushed the corner of her bedroom. And Ron Berkowitz at the old log cabin school building there, who met Henry Miller during the war, standing outside his Big Sur Partington Ridge door, a courtesy Miller noted by saying, you're a nice man, you didn't want to intrude come back any time. And Ron went on to be the boy wonder on Wall Street and retired to the backcountry hills saying, I wasn't the first, I won't be the last. Goodbye, old paint. I'm leaving Cheyenne. 
So long, goodbye, take care, farewell to the willets of my youth. O oh, spare and fictive life, gods and angels obscure, we look out upon the distances, we make ourselves the metaphor. But phantom song, the trace of sound, carries in flight unhindered, it does not drown. And that's a, a long poem, and if, uh, like the uh, old folk ballad, little gray moth sitting on a shelf, if you want another verse, you can sing it yourself. My best wishes and long life like a thousand mountains, like the mountains and rivers and valleys without end. <laughs>